in this um, um, in this subject with us today and to partner with uh, Arizona Wildlife Federation on this concept of, of sacred grounds, this idea of, um, of really um, uh, doing what we can to, to um, do our part. Um, so with that's enough um, talking and I would be happy to um, go on with the program. Nikki, are, are you gonna do the introductions next? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Excellent. I sure am. The first thing we're going to do is, uh, most of you have probably been on a Zoom meeting before, <laughs> um, but I'm going to give a, a quick primer on how to use Zoom. So uh, we're here for the next uh, hour, uh, and uh, what we're going to do is mute everyone who's not speaking. Um, and uh, as we go along today, feel free to use the, uh, the chat bar. So if you uh, bring your uh, cursor down to the bottom of your screen, you'll be given all kinds of different options and your chat is there. It'll pin it right up to the side of the screen. And uh, feel free to ask questions as we go through in the chat. Uh, our speaker may or may not have time to, um, to address those as, uh, as the program's going through, but we will have 10 minutes at the end for questions and we'll get back to your questions at that time. I also want to tell you to leave the chat up, even if you're not asking questions, because we'll have some links that will be coming through um, the chat as we go on. And um, I think I've, if I introduced, if I haven't introduced Ellie Hutchinson yet uh, so far, I want to introduce Ellie to you. She's our tech support, so she'll be sending out a lot of that information. Um, if you have any uh, troubles with, um, with any of the text, please send them to her and she'll help you out. Um, with that, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I get to introduce Gail. I met Gail probably, what, eight, nine, uh, my, uh, maybe even almost 10 years ago. You'll see her um, uh, 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 organization there on the, on the Monarch sticker. Um, we were working um, at, with uh, overlapping projects at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension in Maricopa County. Uh, we've gone out and tagged together. And ever since uh, figure, finding out um, finding out her, about her program, Southwest Monarch Study, I've really come to understand the impact of citizen science and how vital it is um, that we're doing it and that there's wonderful people out there like Gail um, speaking for, for these butterflies because um, uh, when you go and look at butterfly or monarch, especially, especially information, there's hardly any information about Arizona, but Gail is really leading the charge to um, to talk about how, uh, how important Arizona is in the survival of the species. So, Gail, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and you're giving me way too much credit here because we have over 600 people tagging. And it's because of their hard work and observing that we've been able to get where we have. So um, thank you so much. Let me see, slideshow from the beginning. Okay, great. Let me just change my settings of where everyone is showing up real quick, just so I could see what I put on my screen as well. So uh, thank you. I'm going to share some information about monarch butterflies here in Arizona, but also the southwest and then expand out to all the west in a few uh, short minutes. Monarchs are one of the best known butterflies in North America, and when you likely will see one, you'll often find yourself stop right in your tracks. They're often known as the wanderer, and it's easy to stop and question, I wonder where this one came from, or where is this one going? Uh, they're large tropical butterflies that embark on international migrations every year. And they're known as an iconic species, but also an indicator species to let us know how healthy this world we live in is. In case if you are not aware of a, what a monarch looks at, and you would not be alone, on the left you can see a monarch on a flower, and on the lower left here you can see a male monarch. If, and to the right you'll see a queen butterfly. These are both um, part of the same genus, the Danaeus genus, and we see them both in our gardens. They both visit milkweed. On the left we have the monarch. If there is no white dots in the orange, you have a monarch. If you see these white dots in the orange, you have a queen. 
And so uh, if you ever forget about that, we have pictures of those on our website to help you. So everyone always wants to know when are monarchs here? They're here right now. Um, and you can see from this graph that we put together that goes up to our uh, data goes in this graph up to 2019. And that includes around 18,500 monarchs that were tagged. Most of them are heavy during the summer months, especially in September and October. But there are low numbers of them here in different locations throughout the year. And this is a, a great map with Journey North where you could see where Arizona has all the different colors and that is by the different times of year that people are reporting them. So they kind of light up. And while the Eastern uh, wave of the monarchs is much larger than the West, you can still see Arizona actually has a pretty fair density. Our tagging of, of the monarchs have indicated that monarchs go both to Mexico and to California. We're kind of a gateway in the West, which is really interesting. And you can see from uh, citizen scientists tagging up in Utah, it's beginning to look that maybe some of their monarchs might be sweeping through Arizona to go to Mexico as well. So it's, it's exciting findings by people like yourselves that see a monarch that jump in and help us tag where we can learn new things. Don't worry about the details of this. This is just indicating whether they went to California, the blue dots, the uh, tr red triangles went to Mexico, and it helped us learn when do they migrate through. By If we go back to the date you tag them, we can start learning the uh, sun angle of when they've been tagged. And that seems to be a major determining factor. And so we know through the Phoenix area, for example, they come through from about some, uh, September 23rd to October 22nd um, and earlier, higher in the state and later. We will see monarchs longer than that. This is the time that we know they're migrating by tagged recoveries being found in either Mexico or California. And the interesting thing is we've also been able to document small clusters in Arizona, which we weren't sure we would find. On the right uh, was on South Mountain here in the Phoenix area. And on the left uh, was along the Colorado River in Lake Havasu. And then there's monarchs here in winter and, and Patty O'Brien, uh, the great tagger with us here today, actually has uh, played an important role in helping us learn more about them this winter and several others that are doing a study with us and documenting their observations and tagging so we can see their movement. And one of, ta of her tagged ones flew to another yard in um, Mesa and one from that person's yard ended up in my backyard. They've been like musical chairs with the backyards this uh, winter. It's been kind of fun to watch. So when we're talking about monarchs here, we're looking at this entire life cycle from when that egg is laid to they become a caterpillar, they form a chrysalis or a pupa here on the lower right, and they end up emerging and becoming a new butterfly. And our challenge out here is we know what happens with our desert air. We know how warm it was today. We know how chilly it was if you came up this morning. And so that uh, you normally would say would be about a month, but this time of year, if the nights are chilly, can take longer. And during the winter, if they're here, it's even longer than that. So monarchs from Arizona and much of the West end up in Pismo Beach for the winter along the coast. And if you've ever visited there, you can see one of these large clusters. Uh, and this year in 2014, there were 30,000 monarchs at Pismo Beach. But when you look at their long range, you can see what's happened population. And the California overwintering counts are uh, completed every year during the week of Thanksgiving and they're counting individual monarchs and in trees. If there's large numbers, you can uh, take an area and then superimpose that on others. And look at the numbers that have dropped all the way from even just several years ago, there were 192,668 
And this year, there were under 2,000 monarchs counted. Uh, so it was just a very severe drop. In fact, we have been counting more monarchs out here in the, in the Arizona, in the lower deserts, actually, than what they've been able to find in, in parts of California in pockets. And then if you've ever had the opportunity uh, to fly down to Mexico and look at the overwintering sites, you'll have this incredible sight of the weight of monarchs just actually weighing down the branches of the trees. Imagine, you know, one monarch weighs about as much of a paperclip and to have enough on those branches to actually weigh them down. And you can see this year's numbers just came in about a month ago where we saw a drop. We were hopeful when we went back up to six hectares here and now we see this drop again. Um, in Mexico, they count by the number of the amount of trees that are occupied. They count a little different in hectares than we do here um, in California, but they have had these running for a long time, as you can see, since 1994. So it kind of gives us a good model of what's happening from year to year. So there's always this question of this big decline. And I think you're gonna see some of the things that are happening here in Arizona embedded in these reasons. We know that monarchs face multiple threats. I think if it was just one thing, we'd be able to recover from it, but they're getting bombarded on every angle, just like many of our pollinators are today. There's a loss of milkweed, there's a loss of habitat, uh, there's a loss of nectar resources in the spring and the fall. Monarchs can lay their eggs on milkweed, their only host plant, before it flowers. If there aren't other nectar resources nearby, they have a hard time surviving that flight through. Uh, the fall has been a time we've noted uh, through the Southwest Monarch Study, a lot of declining uh, nectar resources. They need to really feed heavily in the fall on those flowers to be to have uh, lipids build up so they can survive all winter long without feeding. So we have a lot of situations going on. We know logging is going on in Mexico and they're expanding avocado farms. Uh, I'm also on the Monarch Butterfly Fund. We're funding research in that area to see what is the effect of the pesticides that they use on the avocado farms that's drain going into their water drain. Uh, we also know in the United States, the overwintering sites in California have severely degraded with many trees that have been down that are just, uh, being restored. We know that there's a big effect of pesticides, especially neonicotinoids on the migration flyways. It's not the same as it is for bees, uh, where we know that there's been spraying of neonics that, that have caused the entire bee colony to collapse. Here, instead with monarchs, it's often a shorter lifetime of the adults flying, so you don't see it right away, but in studies, we've, they've been able to document this. And of course, the climate change has been increasing the frequency and intensity of winter storms, um, and it's expanded areas of droughts and has actually affected the fall migration by our warm falls. So, Many of you know um, that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife was asked to determine if monarchs should be listed as a threatened species, and their decision, decision was decided to come out last December, which it did. Their considerations, I was part of a group that was uh, uh, gathering together to give information regarding the Western population. And they looked at what is the status of those overwintering sites? How do they look? What's happening is milkweed? Is, is milkweed surviving? Is the droughts at the heat? What about that nectar supply? What's happening with climate related effects here? And what other things are happening? Are there different predators? Are there chemicals, insecticides we're not aware? And we had to make decisions and try to project what were the chances of extinction? So they were able to come up with, uh, when they make their decision, it comes up in three different ways. They could say it's not warranted after they've done extensive studies. They could say it's warranted, but, and they could propose it as an endangered or threatened species 
Um, so if it's not warranted, then it just gets put aside or it could be listed as warranted, but of a higher priority. And in that case, it's still a long drawn out process after with a public review and lawsuits that tend to come in. So as of this last December, the Fish and Wildlife Service decide, uh, determined that listing is warranted for monarchs as a threatened species, but it's precluded by higher needs. There is over 161 other species that are ahead of monarchs at this time, but this could be changed in an annual renew. And with those very low numbers coming out of California, that could well, well be the case in this next year. Keep in mind that monarchs east and west range are all one population. And you could see by our tagging information how they could be mixing both in Mexico or in other areas between the east and the west. So here's the other thing that's really important. Anything you do to increase their habitat makes a difference. Everything everyone did the last couple years to increase monarch habitat made a significant difference according to the Fish and Wildlife. Projects increased from over 4,000 wheat restoration projects to over 5,639,992 projects with an additional 491,166,752 milkweed stems in the ground. Talk about precision. They tracked everything everyone did with putting things in the ground. And they also noted that the West, the Western range of monarchs will need to triple their efforts to be able to save the population. And that's where we are today. So the Eastern range of monarchs has a 10% chance of extinction. The West has a 60 to 88% chance of extinction. And both the East and the West populations have been in decline for the last 20 years. And there's a, uh, I shared that uh, link if you want more information to look about that online. We know what last summer was like. We all remember it all too well. But the National Weather Service pointed out that not only did we have temperature extremes, it was our driest monsoon on record. And for the first time ever, every county, every county in Arizona had the driest monsoon on record. Uh, that's the first time that's ever happened. Usually one part of the state that is better where another part is, is uh, needy. This, the projection for the Coming monsoon is actually very good. They think we're going to have above normal rain, and we're all hoping that's really the case. Temperature, we talked about. Uh, my other head is the Monarch Watch Conservation Specialist, and I'm lucky enough to work with Dr. Chip Taylor in that area. And he looked at our temperature increase over the last decade from 1975 to 2020. And you can see the bright red in Arizona. These high temperatures affect not only but their habitat around them as well and other pollinators. We've been very fortunate uh, to receive a, a NFWF grant uh, that we've been adding milkweed and annual sunflower seeds for uh, uh, fall migration nectar around. These are a list of some of the areas that we've supplied it. We're uh, continuing to work with many areas through this summer. So this is our call to action to you. Um, and I know this is something you all seem so interested to work on creating a habitat. Remember milkweed, their host plant. Remember the nectar in the times monarchs are in your region. Remember the importance of trees for afternoon shade as a refuge in storms. And these, the most successful breeding habitats always have water nearby. Uh, water is our precious commodity, but uh, that's the way we can help them during their migration as well when we irrigate occasionally our native gardens. And then of course, we always want you to become a community scientist, report your sightings, uh, help us monitor tag and advocate uh, for healthy environments.
Um, here's our information to contact if we could help you in any way. Our first papers, the status of monarch butterflies in uh, Arizona is on our website. Uh, we're working on our second paper we hope to have published later this year with additional information. And thank you so much for all your interest. There are actually plants uh, listed on our website that visit regularly that we've been able to pull out of our tagging data and uh, kind of make monarchs wish lists, so to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gail. Uh, make sure to stick around because I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing some questions come up in the chat. So. Uh, We'll get back. Um, we'll uh, spend some time at the end of uh, the end of our hour, making sure to answer some of these questions. Um, sure so will. now we're gonna. Awesome, thank you. Uh, now we're gonna go over to Marlene Shamus, and um, to remind you, uh, and Marlene's sporting her wonderful shirt there from the Arizona Master Naturalist Program down in down in uh, Pima County, which is awesome. We have um, we do have some Arizona Master Naturalists. Uh, groups in uh, Maricopa County, and hopefully one is busted coming up soon. Um, so that's very exciting. And um, and Marlene, tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, and then we can have you talk about how to how to get your hands in the ground. Okay. Um, thank you, and it's nice to be here with you this evening. Um, I just want to acknowledge that my presence um, is on the ancestral land of the Tohono O'odham. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the plants that um, monarchs love and need and um, how to grow those. And um, this will be uh, kind of um, on the side of the, the master gardener. So um, we know that the best way to help monarchs is to rebuild habitat and provide food. And so I'm going to be talking about how to provide the food for them. Um, we know that milkweed is the only source of food for monarch caterpillars and that our milkweed plant population is down by 90%. So to promote the monarch population, we need to plant milkweed. So there's two ways um, to plant milkweed. We can either start milkweed from seed or we can plant the uh, mature um, plant. Um, and if you decide to plant from seed, there's two different ways you can go about that. You can plant the seed directly in the ground, or you can start the seeds indoors and plant the seed, transplant the seedlings. <clears throat> in order to plant the seeds outdoors, you wanna plant in late November, and you wanna pick a location that has full sun and good drainage. Plant about one eighth inch deep, 18 inches apart and put about three seeds in each hole. Then you'll want to water them thoroughly and <clears throat> keep them moist, <clears throat> excuse me, until the winter rains start. <clears throat> Milkweed seeds need cold stratification, which means that they must be exposed to winter cold in order to germinate. This helps crack the seed's hard outer coating. <clears throat> so the second way you can um, produce your milkweeds is by planting your seeds, starting your seeds indoors, and then transplanting the seedlings. <clears throat> In order to do this, um, the way you would uh, cold strata, uh, do cold stratification is by placing the seeds um, in a damp paper towel in a Ziploc bag and place them in the refrigerator for three to six weeks. So you'll have to plan this so that you'll want them to germinate in the, uh, um, early spring. And then to germinate them, you'll take one, one to two seeds and put them in a peat pot <clears throat> that's filled with um, potting soil. And you'll wanna again, cover them lightly and place them in a sunny window and then keep them moist and they should germinate in 10 um, to 15 days. Um, you'll transplant the seedlings outdoors, then put the peat pots directly into the soil um, when, the, when the plants are no larger than three inches tall and after the threat of uh, frost. So this would be in the early spring. And then the other way <clears throat> to start your milkweeds is to buy the mature plants and just to plant them either 
in the fall, October to November, or in the spring, March and April. Um, we know that um, enhancing the populations of milkweed through private home gardens um, can foster the population of monarchs and it can add um, new flowering perennials to our home gardens. But monarch butterflies need more than milkweed. <clears throat> The adult, the adult butterflies also need nectar plants for their food. So now I want to um, <clears throat> tell you about some common milkweed and nectar plants that are good for uh, uh, attracting monarchs to your home garden. There are three um, milkweed plants species that uh, we recommend for the low desert. These are Asclepias subulata, which is the desert or rush milkweed, Asclepias linaria, which is the pine leaf milkweed, and Asclepias angustifolia, the Arizona milkweed. There is another one um, called Asclepias parasabica, which is the tropical milkweed. It's a beautiful plant and the monarchs just love it. But um, there is a problem with it in that it may interfere with migration. It's been shown that there's a protozoal parasite that lives on this plant that infects the larva of the butterfly. And it's been related to lower migration, decreased body mass, decreased mating, decreased in, in flight ability and also decreases in lifespan. So although it's beautiful and the monarchs love it, try to avoid um, tropical milkweed. Some nectar plants <clears throat> are next and it's best to plant native um, nectar plants because they're low water use. Um, and <clears throat> remember that butterflies like tubular flowers. Um, because of their long proboscis, and they need a place on the flower to land called a landing pad because they can't hover when they're drinking like hummingbirds. They have to land um, while they're sipping their nectar. Some common <clears throat> um, nectar plants uh, in the low desert are wolfberry, verbena, berry duster, Fleabane, bee brush, and asters. There are also three butterfly mist plants. They're not native, but the monarchs love them and they're very, very um, successful in attracting monarchs to your garden. These are Ageratum, Conoclinium, and Chromolena. They all have a beautiful, um, blue purple flower um, that's very, very attractive to the butterflies. And when you're planting your garden, remember to plant clusters of plants because these are more, se more easily seen as the butterflies fly past. We all know that climate change is affecting plants and monarchs. And the way this is, could be happening is in the warmer weather, there's earlier earlier blossoming of plants. Are the butterflies here earlier in the spring when the plants are flowering? This is a question that needs to be answered. Timing gets upset with weather changes. Now I just wanted to mention a few plant sales in nurseries which support native plants. These are um, low desert, um, mostly in Tucson. But um, the first is Desert Survivors Nursery, Spadefoot Nursery, which is an online nursery only. Tohono Chul has a plant sale spring and fall, and they also have a nursery. The Desert Museum, the Botanical Gardens, and Tucson Audubon all have um, spring plant sales. And just a note about pesticides. You can always ask if your plants have been treated with pesticides. And please try to not use them in your own home gardens. 
They not only discourage pests, but they also destroy beneficial insects. Um, to discourage pests, plant a variety of host and nectar plants. I know milkweed um, tend to get aphids a lot and try not to use pesticides on, on your um, milkweed, but use uh, spray the aphids with soapy water and this won't eliminate them, but it will control them so that they won't cause any, any damage. And then one last thing um, I wanted to uh, uh, promote is a Monarch Way Station program where your home garden can become a Monarch Way Station if you have certain um, plants in your, uh, in your habitat. Um, so you need to have um, host and nectar plants. You need to have trees or shrubs where the uh, monarchs can um, be protected. And then you need to have um, a wet area uh, for the butterflies to obtain minerals. Um, they, they suck up the dirty uh, water from the mud uh, piles and it gives mud puddles and it gives them um, the minerals they need for um, their life cycle. So that's all I have on the plants for monarchs and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Marlene. Um, you gave us a, uh, an awesome plant list. <laughs> it's really fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna share a couple more resources with you for some other plant lists. So um, now that I've moved out of the valley and I'm back up into this um, higher elevation up in, up in Payson, I uh, was very excited to, um, I'm very excited to start putting a bunch of milkweeds in my yard. Um, and one of the ones that I see a lot, I'm going to share, uh, I'm going to share a picture or two with you guys. I'm um, going to go back to that screen share at the very beginning. Let's see. Um, uh, one of the things, one of the ones that I see a lot on the Muggy on Rim, especially between, um, between Payson and Camp Verde on, uh, on 260, is the, is this is antelope horn, right, Gail? Hopefully you're seeing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I saved some seed this year. We'll see how we'll see how that one goes. Um, again, full sun on these, um, and you know if you're in those um, higher elevations, they are already um, conditioned to have that have that frost and have the snow on them. So um, the trick is then putting them in the fridge and remembering to do that. As gardeners, you know we we kind of remember when it's um, when it's time to do it. And, forgot maybe that we were supposed to put something in the fridge for a few a few weeks to get them ready to go. Um, so I have uh, I have some of these started in my uh, in inside my house and, and outside. So hopefully it's gonna get some going this year. Um, here's that wonderful blue mist that uh, Marlene was talking about and uh, and a monarch sitting pretty on there. Um, any plant that we can give them that has a lot of flowers in one spot. So asters are fantastic. For, um, uh, for, for butterflies specifically, but of course they welcome a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of pollinators as well. And Gail mentioned um, sunflowers. And uh, if you're following some of the other conservation um, uh, webinars that are coming out right now, and it's so wonderful, uh, you know, it's one, one good thing about COVID is there's awesome webinars going on right now that um, a lot more information that we can that we can uh, connect to instead of having to be there uh, in person and some of us not being able to travel. So um, this is the, the, the um, you know, the silver lining about our pandemic for sure is that now we get these amazing uh, webinars coming out. Um, Doug Tallamy wrote a book recently called Nature's Best Hope, where he talks about four different plants that are really important uh, for wildlife and uh, really helping to keep wildlife alive. And uh, of trees, it was oaks and willows. Um, and then uh, uh, plants, it was uh, sunflower seeds and, oh my gosh, now I've blanked on the last one. Um, pretty much anything in the aster family, but sunflowers were the really important ones. And I'm sorry, I have about 10 pieces of paper out. It'll come back to me what, the, what our fourth one was. It's here. Um, uh, Um, it's on my list here somewhere. Um, so uh, planting other plants along with um, along with our milkweeds is super super important. 
Um, here's that tropical milkweed that uh, that Marlene uh, mentioned as well. It does grow fantastically up in the higher elevations. So this is at Blue Ridge. Uh, it is along a stream, so most likely it was brought in from somewhere else. Um, but I have video of it must have been 20 to 50 butterflies just absolutely really enjoying this. Um, but again, very important to, you know, if you're going out and buying, buying milkweed, find a local source. Um, and uh, Marlene gave you a list of a, a bunch of places that have milkweeds for sale. I've got a few others that I'm going to add to that. Um, so uh, Boyce Thompson Arboretum uh, has their annual plant sale. Um, I might have bought out all their, all their milkweeds, though. Maybe. Um, <laughs> let's see. The cactus, cactusstore.com also is another one. They're in Phoenix. Uh, Underwood Gardens is in uh, the Prescott area, and it was through them that I found a site called Arizona Milkweeds for Monarchs. Hopefully, uh, 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 Gail, you know about that. They have a um, plant sale coming up April 10. Um, so I'm hoping that that's true. Um, I didn't see any more information aside from the date. So uh, looking forward to that. Flagstaff Arboretum, if you're up in the northern area. And then uh, uh, Native Seed Search as well down in Tucson. Also great. Um, Great options for being able to buy seeds and uh, and uh, and hopefully milkweeds. Um, and sometimes they're a little bit hard to find um, because they're not the you know they're not necessarily what you they're definitely not what you're going to find in Home Depot. They're not the most beautiful plants ever. Um, hopefully, we'll start changing that. Is that we'll start seeing more uh, milkweeds grown locally and uh, and for sale. Um, really amazing numbers coming out about how many milkweeds have planted. And one of the things that, that, um, that we've been talking about is that we can make a difference. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, oh, one other thing that I wanted to point out with you was a couple other uh, options for you. Let's see if they're in the chat yet. No, not. Okay. Um, a couple other resources for you. Um, Xerces Society and National Wildlife uh, have put together, there's a National Wildlife Plant Finder, um, which I'm going to show you in just a little bit, but they put together um, uh, several different PDFs for different regions. And um, Ellie, hopefully you can find my link to this um, on the document that I gave you. Um, there is one for deserts, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. If you live up at the higher elevations, so get the Rocky Mountain one as well. They're, you know, free download. Um, through uh, National Wildlife Federation's website, and that'll give you uh, plants that grow in the higher altitudes as well. But you'll want both of them because if you're anywhere in the 3,000 to 6,000 foot level, some of those desert desert plants that are at the lower elevations will work fantastically at those higher elevations too. So let me show you that other resource. And that one's this is this is the version for um, uh, nectar plants in the southwest, and it's going to give you a wonderful list of of um, different plants along with their um, with their Latin names, so that when you go to these nurseries, you can find the exact uh, items that you're looking for. Because of course, a lot of plants have their common names are shared with several other plants, so you don't want to go in there with just the common name. You might come home with something that's not at all related to what you actually wanted to look for. All right, another resource that I'm going to talk about, of course, this one's my favorite. I'm a little bit biased uh, considering that I'm with the um, National Wildlife Federation, is the Gardening for Wildlife program um, that, um, that the National Wildlife Federation hosts. So uh, as a state affiliate, one of my jobs is to promote this wonderful program. Um, if you get on their website, the Garden for Wildlife website, there's a lot of resources for you. Um, but one of the one of the things that helps this is um, what we're really promoting with National Wildlife Federation is for you to certify your your yard. Now, um, when we say your yard, we're actually open up to a lot of different possibilities. Um, you can certify your home, uh, your patio, um, your uh, place of business. Um, maybe you have a nature center. Um, or uh, a venue such as the zoo or uh, a garden, like the Desert Botanical Garden, the Tohono O'Toole Garden. Um, and you can also um, register your, your uh, place of worship through the, uh, and you do, it, you do it all through the same, the same place, uh, is this Garden for Wildlife location uh, website. 
And then uh, you can also register or try to get your whole community to join in. So the community of Ajo is, um, is a, is a um, certified wildlife habitat, which is just awesome that the whole community came together. There are certain, um, there are certain benchmarks to reach, how many backyards and, and how many, um, how many non-backyards, how many people you get involved with this program. Uh, we're hoping to do this um, also in Cottonwood with the Friends of the Verde River. So one of, um, one of the uh, promotions that are going on in different parts of our state. Um, so on this page, the Garden for Wildlife page, you'll get a lot of um, background information about how to help uh, garden for wildlife, whether it's birds, uh, butterflies, larger, larger animals, some of them you want to keep out, some of them you want to bring in, right? Um, and to certify um, on their website, there's different pages uh, of information and you want to go to the certified page. Let's see if I can get that. Um, there is a list of items that you need. You need five different, um, five different important things, which are food, water, cover, places to raise young and sustainable practices. And there's a sheet to download um, that will give you ideas about what, um, what you might be able to use. Um, uh, here at my home in Payson, I have um, downed tree branches, which are creating cover for, uh, for animals. I also have lots of, of um, plants that are uh, forming a canopy so that um, larger predatory birds um, have a harder time seeing those small birds. Um, Marlene talked about water. We can do um, puddling uh, for, for uh, wildlife. Um, is good enough even, you know, just for butterflies. Uh, if you're trying to attract larger animals, the more water that you have, the more you will attract for sure. Um, and they're really not difficult. And it's also, uh, it's self-disciplining. So um, as your representative here in, in Arizona, I'm not going to come to your house and like double check that you have everything on your list. Um, you know, you, you will just, um, you will say what you have and we'll trust you with that. Um, and uh, the, the, like I said, the checklist gives you more ideas for additional things you can do. Um, but I am here to help if, uh, if you have questions and I'm gonna, I'll put my um, information in the chat and hopefully Marlene and Gail will do the same and, and Nona will also do the same. And um, we can help you with gardening questions. Perhaps you're new to gardening, uh, perhaps you're new to the idea of gardening for wildlife or perhaps you're in a new space. Um, our new elevation. Uh, every, every place, especially here in Arizona, we have microclimates all over the place. If you have more trees, you're going to have a little bit more shade. Um, if you have more sun, obviously it's going to get a little bit warmer. So um, your home might be a completely different situation than uh, a home, uh, you know, five, five blocks away. And we need that. Um, what, uh, what we're hearing is all those little, uh, little things that we're doing are counting. So when we're talking about um, habitat loss, we can replace uh, some of that habitat or uh, enhance what, uh, what might have been here before in our backyard. Um, the, uh, another threat to monarchs was the pesticide use and, and uh, with some sustainable practices, um, you can reduce your uh, reliance on pesticides. We were talking about aphids, you know, hitting them with soapy water, also just coming along and brushing them off with your hands uh, works as well, yeah. Um, and then um, as far as climate change too, let me show you another, um, another really amazing um, uh, resource that I found when I was digging around. Now this one is from, there we go. Uh, this one's from the World Wildlife Fund and what they, what they did was look at climate change um, issues regarding different types of wildlife. And of course, uh, monarchs was one of the uh, wildlife that they looked at. And you'll get a little primer on, on uh, uh, monarchs and their, um, and their migration. And then what they did was look at different categories of, um, of, of climate change issues that might be um, contributing to uh, uh, monarch threats, right? So um, really interesting download you can, uh, Again, um, let's see if I can get that into the chat for us. Uh, really interesting reading. Some of this uh, doesn't affect monarchs as much as others. So if we talk about what's going on here in Arizona, obviously our temperatures can get really, really high. At some point, uh, monarchs just can't take it. Uh, we also have some places in the state where our temperatures get really low. Uh, but we do have a lot of places in our state that have uh, the fluctuations, but they also have, it's pretty moderate. 
for for our monarchs, right? So uh, in some places, uh, adding a few extra trees might help to create that microclimate um, to help monarchs uh, survive during a cold snap, um, and uh, or creating a cover might help to create a little bit of a warmer microclimate if you're in uh, the higher elevations, keeping the snow or frost off of them. Um, one of the things that they're definitely finding with monarchs uh, is that they are somewhat resistant to some things that happen with climate change, right? Because they will have several generations uh, in the course of a year, and they'll also lay a lot of eggs. So that helps them to recover. And we saw that on some of the graphs that uh, that Gale had was uh, in some years, even if there was a dip, there is recovery possible, which is just wonderful. It's wonderful to hear those success stories. Um, and then, uh, they, they, we, they also have a very wide distribution. They're all over North America. And then there's also, I didn't realize, they're outside of North America too. So um, some parts of Asia and Africa, and those, uh, or Asia and, um, and Australia are some populations of monarchs too. So with that wide distribution, there's also different places that the monarchs can go. If there's severe storms in some locations. Uh, thankfully, there's populations in other areas that are probably not affected by that storm. And that's one of the things that is happening with climate change is we do get not just the higher um, uh, 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 higher temperatures creating uh, more drought, which we're seeing here in Arizona, um, but there's also more extreme weather events. So uh, cold snap might happen all of a sudden or um, uh, stronger flooding might happen, especially um, especially in, in Phoenix where we get a, we have a lot of asphalt and concrete that makes for a lot of um, rain is not able to percolate down in the soil. So we might get more flooding if that happens. Um, so those are threats to monarchs, also compounded by climate change. Uh, but thankfully, like we said, uh, monarchs are fairly resilient creatures and there's so much that we can do as individuals. So let's talk a little bit about that, of what we can do as individuals as well. So there's a lot of adaptation that monarchs can go through. There's a lot of adaptation that a lot of other animals can go through. Um, some animals can have these adaptations happen a lot faster than others. Um, and we're having to adapt as well, right? But we can also advocate for, uh, for climate change solutions. So um, uh, Arizona Wildlife Federation um, does do advocacy. And one of the options that we have for you on our website is um, we have um, a letter that can go out to uh, our elected officials. And we have that all set up for you very, very easy. Um, so on our main page, ArizonaWildlife.org, um, we have some of our different campaigns. Here's the one for Climate Action for Wildlife. Um, and this, uh, this landing page will give you some information, but we also have this letter and it's already written um, and you can customize it. So uh, this letter is pretty, uh, is pretty um, wide open for a lot of different out, um, outdoor adventures that you might have. You might be a hunter, you might be a gardener, you might be a bird watcher. Um, and so this, this letter is kind of evergreen for, uh, for all of us who enjoy the outdoors, but you can also add to it. Um, and these letters will go to your Arizona House of Representatives and then uh, our two senators as well. It's a really easy way to keep up that drumbeat of what's going on in um, with climate change and that action needs to happen. So easy, easy thing for you to do. Um, Is that I'm gonna now turn it over to, yeah, that's online. So that's at arizonawildlife.org. In other Thank words, you you, it, and the letter is sent online? It's an e-letter? Um, yes, it's sent, yes, it's sent to them as an email. So then they don't have to worry about it going through um, uh, you know, going through any of the snail mail uh, slowdowns that they have in the government, um, you know, making sure that our mail is safe there. So um, with that, I'm going to turn that over to Nona, and she'll give us a little inspirational message, and then we'll have some time for questions. Oh, Nona, you're on mute. There we go. Yes. There. I had so many things going on, on my screen, I couldn't find my mute button. Um, so many resources, it's exciting. Thank you so much to everyone who um, participated. I just learned a lot and uh, I'm very inspired. I, I would have to say so much of, of advocacy work can be really discouraging. Um, you know, you're talking to, you feel like you're fighting this uphill battle against a lot of, of interests with lots of money and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, 
power and and you're a voice for you know butterflies in the earth and you're you're just feeling sometimes like it's hard to see the progress and i i think that one of the most exciting things about a lot of the programs that um that um uh, nikki's been talking about with the arizona wildlife federation and with what uh, gail's talking about with the citizen scientist programs are that you as a as a um and I think Marlene um, talked some about the citizen scientist program too. You you have a way as an individual to feel like you're making some difference, and collectively, clearly, it can make a difference. And you're putting your your deepest beliefs into action. Which in um, this time of we've all gone through a year of where there's been a lot of talk about depression and um, what it's been like for our mental health to be, you know, kind of trapped in in um, in our work in our places of wherever we are. And um, I think the idea that you can get outside, get really inspired by nature, be in this moment right now and not just totally projecting into a future that feels too frightening to think about, but to be in this space and knowing you're doing everything you can do to make a difference is, is hugely um, powerful for your own well-being and mental health. And um, so I want to give you um, uh, some cheerleading along that line. And um, at Arizona Interfaith Power and Light, um, we, um, we do advocacy you know, for renewable energy. We do advocacy for food system sustainability and environmental justice. And um, as part of that, this idea of, of what we can do as individuals, you know, whether it's planting trees to improve the, the, the tree canopy and cool down our, our space, um, switching to less water intensive um, landscaping at practices. Um, there's just a lot that, that we can do that makes a difference. So I really want to encourage you to feel empowered to do that. Um, and I just have to put a plug in in case um, you don't come back to me for a program that um, there's a lot of programs coming up because Earth Month is coming up and Earth Week and Faith Climate Action Week in the, in the, in the faith world, um, which is uh, the week of Earth Day, which is April 22nd. And uh, we are doing um, um, a program called Sustaining Soil and Souls, um, Soul, Stories of Faith, Food and Faith on April 18th. I know there's a, a film called Kiss the Ground, which is really about soil and the regenerative capacity of soil to really address climate change, to stabilize climate by just holding carbon in the ground. And I know that um, the uh, Franciscan Renewal Center is doing um, uh, programs around that on April 16th and April 24th. First. And so there's a lot going on and I would encourage you to keep an eye on the calendars in April because we'll be inspired in many, many ways to um, support things both with your, your sweat equity, your spiritual equity, and your, I'm sure your dollars, everybody needs money to support all of these programs. But, uh, and we are, I'm in Phoenix on Tohono O'odham and Pima lands and I'm sorry that I forgot to do my land acknowledgement in the beginning because I think that's so, so appropriate and important to remember the indigenous people who took care of this land for so long and we have done such a poor job of maintaining this land as we took control. So we have a lot of work to do to make up for that. But um, I know that there's questions. Um, are you, Nikki, are you gonna mediate the questions or Ellie, are you? Um, going to address that? Let's go ahead and open it up for questions. A lot of the questions have come through the chat, and I know uh, several of you have been answering those. So if your question's already answered, fantastic. Um, but if you um, are ready to ask a question, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it aloud or in the chat. Either one. Well, if you're making a mud puddle in Arizona, it's going to attract mosquitoes. What do you see as a good way to not attract mosquitoes with a mud puddle? Um, well, I was just trying to answer that in the chat. Um, but I think um, <clears throat> if you put, if you use a, an emitter on your irrigation line and just make mud and not have standing water, it's the standing water that the mosquitoes are attracted to and they need to lay their eggs in. Um, and um, the butterflies just need to sip up the mud, the very uh, watery mud in order to get their minerals. So I think that might uh, um, work out for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a question about the mud. Um, 
how much of a size of a, a watery, muddy area do you need for about how many acres? About oh. four acre area. Like, well, you would want to put it around your where your plants are, and you just need. Um, you probably won't get um, a whole flock of butterflies. In, I don't know what's called a flock butterflies in there all at once. So uh, about you know a big um, dinner plate or serving plate size would be plenty. And that would work for four acres? Well, you want to do that everywhere you have um, your native plants okay. set out that are attracting the butterflies. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, may I also ask, how about chuparosa for a plant? Um, chuparosa is a little bit hard for butterflies because um, they don't really have a large enough place to land on. Um, the the chuparosa is better for the hummingbirds, but um, not so good for butterflies. Thank you. Of course, it's great to cover all your bases by planting a wide variety of plants, yes. for sure. Uh -huh. And it's pretty, too. Yeah. Beautiful. I have a question about plants that could be planted. I have a north-facing block wall in my backyard. And uh, so it gets some shade now, but I think in the summer, I don't know if it'll get a lot of shade or not. Um, what plants could I put in a three foot wide area between the pool and the uh, block wall that would attract butterflies? On, on the north facing wall is a little bit difficult because um, it's in the shade a lot and it's, uh, it's the coldest uh, wall in the winter. Um, so uh, you probably want to put out some um, perennials that are frost uh, tolerant. Um, the wolfberry would be good there. Um, they grow tall enough that they'll get a lot of sun. Um, the verbena is probably a little bit too low. Uh, the bee brush would be another one that I would suggest. It grows pretty I just, tall. I just bought one today at Boyce Thompson Arboretum. Oh, good. Yeah. Great. Um, I had the question about if quail were predators, and the answer was um, quail are not butterfly predators. They eat plant parts. So would they be a problem with um, the growth of the um, plants that would attract the monarchs? Um, well, quail eat mostly grains and seeds, and um, uh, so probably not because the butterflies are after the nectar and the seeds will come later on with the fruits, not with the flowers. So the quail would be going after uh, the fruits rather than the flowers. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There was a question, is lantana similar to verbena in attracting butterflies? Lantana is wonderful in attracting butterflies. The only thing is it's not native and it requires a little bit more water than our native plants. But it is a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, butterfly attractant, yes. So if I have the um, volunteer lantana growing in my yard, they're not native? Oh, the volunteer ones, um, I would, I would uh, guess would be native, yeah. And mine are orange, and I see the, that a lot of the ones that are cultivated in landscapes um, are purple or a different color, but mine are all orange. Orange is, is good. The orange one is the one that is, uh, attracts the butterflies more than the yellow or the um, lighter colored ones.
So we had some wonderful uh, questions here. This has been really, really interesting and, and very inspiring to me as, uh, as a constant gardener. <laughs> uh, so I know I've got, um, you know, I, I'm at, uh, my season is just beginning. So I'm very excited as you guys are closing up your season. Um, so I really want to thank um, uh, Gail and Marlene for being with us today. Uh, it was very short notice that we gave them. So I'm very, very happy they, they were able to come visit with us today. Um, Nona and I really wanted to make sure that we got this webinar to you before the close of, uh, of Phoenix and Tucson's, um, you know, the, the low desert uh, planting season. So there's still a little bit of time that you can work that out, uh, add some stuff for, uh, for next year, have a plan. Uh, and then uh, before the hot weather is to get uh, some plants if you're able to buy them from some of these nurseries that we, that we were able to, to give you this list if you're able to get any more plants in the ground. There's still a little bit of time. It's always worth it, always worth it to plant a plant for sure. Um, so thank you all for joining us so very much. Uh, we will have this recording available on um, uh, definitely or uh, Arizona Wildlife Federation's YouTube and hopefully it, uh, Arizona Interface Power and Light will also put it on their, uh, their YouTube as well. Please uh, continue to send us questions um, as uh, uh, this is part of what I do for my job. So when you ask me a gardening question, I'm like, yay, I can spend some work time answering your question. So I love that. Uh, always happy to help. Um, and you'll see some more programs, uh, you know, coming out for gardening for wildlife. We want to do a lot more of that here in Arizona. As many of you know, when you go to research gardening information, it's very East Coast centric. So we're going to change that by giving more and more information out about uh, the wonderful places that we can garden here in Arizona. Um, so uh, uh, I know for Arizona Wildlife Federation also, uh, when we put it up on YouTube, the chat will be there as well. We gave you tons and tons of resources in that chat. Um, so many great links from all of us, which is just excellent. Um, so uh, I wanna make sure that I can put that out there for you guys to, uh, to look over all those wonderful, um, wonderful uh, resources as well. So thank you again for being here. Um, I know I'm going to stick around for another few minutes. So if you still have any additional questions, you are welcome to stick around. But otherwise, that's going to formally close our presentation. Thank you for being with us today. And we hope to see you again.